Thanks very much, John. Um, it's great to be here and thank you to Servier for sponsoring this. I don't have a disclosure slide, but I just wanted to let you know that this presentation contains a lot of off-label um, medication uh, suggestions and the research is my own research. Uh, Servier have had nothing to do with the slides or any other bits and um, the references are attached at the end. Uh, I do receive an honorarium from Servier for doing this, but as I say, that hasn't that they have not had no input into the presentation. So just to recap, something um, following further from what Anne Bust had to say was that unfortunately in Australia, 43% of women have experienced mental illness at some point in their life, and 22% of Australian women compared to 18% of men in the past 12 months from the uh, National Survey of Mental Health and Wellbeing had experienced mental ill health. The problem, uh, of course, hasn't changed very much since then and we are looking to influence government to do another national survey fairly soon. When we look at what happens for women um, or in terms of mental health or mental illnesses, we do find that in fact women are much more susceptible to such things as having uh, twice as likely incidence of developing depression, uh, twice to even more uh, incidence of anxiety disorders, anorexia, bulimia, three times more common, two times uh, more likely to attempt suicide, and two times more likely to have um, post-traumatic stress disorder. The um, sad issues in terms of equality is that women are catching up in terms of alcohol dependence to men, although men clearly are, are dominant in that alcohol dependence problem. The whole impact of this is quite significant, not just in Australia but around the world, and the estimated economic impact of depression and anxiety in women in Australia in terms of thinking about direct productivity loss is estimated to be $22 billion per year. So if you add in the further costs of treatments, lost earnings, the uh, loss of effective parenting, divorce, care of the elderly and so on, the, the figure would be even further astronomically high. So you, you know, it's very clear that uh, mental health in women or mental illness in women is gendered, just like physical health is. And really we need to understand and think about the gender of our patient when we're actually put, we're in a treating hat or we're wearing a research hat or teaching. Because there are different forms of mental illnesses but there are different vulnerabilities and even with the same illness there can be different expressions and treatment responses. So when we look at this difference, it actually is helpful for both genders. So I'm, I'm never trying to say that women are suffering more than men or, or vice versa. It's actually about the difference. And once we can focus on that, we can actually hopefully provide better outcomes. Why is it that we have a difference? Well, the theories broadly fall into the categories of social theories, biological theories and psychological theories. When we look at the social aspects of why women develop the illnesses in the way that they do, there are issues that are very clearly different in terms of violence, poverty, gender inequities in wages, power, social roles. They do have a big impact on mental health. Then there's a significant number of biological differences, including the hormone aspects, circuitry, genetic transmission. And then there are psychological def defense mechanism differences and so on. So you put all those in to complicated algorithms for why there are differences. If we look at the global social impacts on women's mental health, and in my hat as the president of the International Association for Women's Mental Health, I'm very fortunate to see what is going on for women's mental health in different countries around the world. And there are definite global social impacts that are actually we've gone backwards in terms of women's mental health in the last um, five years. And this is one of the big impacts. Um, you know, it, it may seem that we're sitting here in comfortable Melbourne and, uh, you know, we have a lot of social programs, etc., etc. We can speak our minds, we can do a lot of things. But unfortunately, the impact that global politicians have does trickle down to our population. 
Uh, in another hat, I'm a mentor for young women leaders at Monash University. These are not just medical um, leaders, but leaders from different faculties. And what really upset me is that in the light of all of this, the number of young women who say they want to go into politics or into uh, occupations that would put them front and centre has diminished significantly because of the way the media treats women and because of the global impact and the comments that are made that are very derogatory. So again, this is an issue that we need to be mindful of for our younger generation who are our future, that we're already losing that battle in terms of the social differences and the power differentials. Um, I was very saddened to um, learn from my Russian colleagues uh, who attended our last Congress um, that in fact the domestic violence laws in Russia have changed uh, and this was only changed in February 2017 that in fact the new laws in Russia state that a woman must have greater than or equal to two fractures in different parts of her body in order for the uh, perpetrator to be arrested for a charge of domestic violence and that it must be in different parts of the body so two fractured ribs doesn't make it. So these sorts of issues are really, really significant. The other thing that is of real concern to me is that the three delegates who turned up, one um, of the delegates I've not heard from, even though she was a very regular correspondent with me, uh, she's just disappeared uh, for the last three months and I cannot find where she has gone to. Um, in Ireland, this was our Congress, was in Dublin um, in 2017. And uh, what I learnt and what we all learnt and what we all marched down the, the main streets of Dublin about was reproductive rights for Irish women. And this is something that they've had a, a, um, a vote, uh, sorry, a uh, referendum, and now that has to go to vote in Parliament. And the referendum was overwhelmingly positive for reproductive rights because mental health rights are connected to reproductive rights. And uh, I learned all sorts of things that, that horrified me because I had thought, yes, Ireland is a republic like, uh, like we are. And yet there were rules such as a woman of reproductive age, before she could get a passport or travel overseas, had to have a certificate from her GP stating that she was not pregnant. Now that was all about um, trying to prevent um, the woman from getting an abortion overseas. And of course, there is a big traffic between London and, uh, and Dublin for abortions. So hopefully some of these things might actually change.